Hello, good to see you. Pastor Sam with the devotion for April 6th. Should have really looked at this ahead of time. Anyway, we're continuing our look at the book of Hebrews, and today we'll be looking into the sacrificial system a little bit. Now, before we had talked about Jesus as our priest, and that kind of dealt with the sacrifices, today's going to be a little bit different focus. We are going to look at the actual sacrifices themselves and then see how Jesus is the once for all perfect sacrifice. We'll be getting into that today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our reading for today is Hebrews 10, 1 through 18. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would not have ceased to be offered. Would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. For where there is forgiveness, there is no longer any offering for sin. Now what the, uh, so a little bit, little bit of nits that I need to pick with myself. Uh, what the writer of the book of Hebrews is doing is really focusing on the animals to be sacrificed. And now before you jump at calling Jesus an animal, yes, we're going to refer to him as the Lamb of God. So I realize that he's a human person, but we're going to kind of treat him as a bit of an animal in, in his being sacrificed, just like the bulls and goats and lambs would have been. <clears throat> now what we've got, there's, there's kind of this, um, in verse 1, is sort of hinting at the problem. Right? The law was a shadow of the good things to come. Now, um, real, really, you could say this of the whole Old Testament, that everything God did in the Old Testament was just a shadow of the good things to come. Now, a shadow has form in itself. A shadow, um, right? you can identify by the shadow of a thing what that thing will be. And you, you, you can identify, now looking backwards, the, where was I going with this? The shadow of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. You can look at events like the Passover and the Exodus. You can look at things like the sacrificial system. You can look at things like, or people like King David and be, oh, those are shadows that Jesus Christ is casting back into time, back into the Old Testament. Those, those things are, act, are Jesus Christ, are pointing to Jesus Christ. Maybe I better say it that way. And and they're, um, I'll say, incomplete. Incomplete in the sense that Jesus Christ is going to fulfill them. Even the things that weren't necessarily thought of as prophecies, like the 
sacrificial system because the same sacrifices are continually offered every year. Now this would be kind of the, and, and the Jewish people still do this, um, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, they still have this kind of one day a year, which is the, the day of sacrifice where their sins are wiped away. So they are actually still performing this, which is um, what we'll get to down here in verse 11, talking about that. But the, the writer makes this point. They, they couldn't make perfect. Otherwise, would, wouldn't they have stopped? Right? If, if those sacrifices could remove sins permanently, then why are they still doing them? It is the writer's point. And they're still doing them because those sacrifices are, are powerful but not able to remove sin. What I mean by that is they have to be offered every year on this periodic basis. And that's according to God's own word. And, and so we can, we can um, understand this as this yearly sacrifice needed to be offered again and again according to God's command as a way to mediate sin. Not necessarily to remove sin, because again, we're going to come to Jesus Christ as that, but these yearly sacrifices would mediate sin. They would, um, God, the, I, I think I talked about this one time earlier, where the blood of the animal uh, was shed in place of your blood, kind of an exchange system, a, a barter system, if you want to be a little bit crass with it. Anyway, the, thus far our text, right? <laughs> uh, now, verse 3 is, is kind of interesting because I wouldn't have thought about it this way. In these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. We have to keep doing this, for one, because we keep sinning. We need to keep, for, for us today, I'm talking, we need to keep confessing our sins, asking God for forgiveness because we keep sinning. For the people of the Old Covenant, of the Old Testament, they needed to continually offer new animals every year because they had sinned over the past year. And in presenting this mediation for sin, they're again reminded of their own shortcomings. There's a reminder of sins. Now, what, what I love about, especially this uh, chapter 10, I almost said verse 10, what I love about this chapter 10 and what I love about Jesus in general is he is fulfilling prophecies that weren't thought of as prophecies. Now, when we get down to the bottom, there, that, that's a little bit more, okay, that's a prophecy. But even, even up here, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken, oops, holy highlighting, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Now, Jesus is, no, people, so, okay, a little bit of an aside. I don't think people were making as, as the Old Testament was being given and written, I don't think people were making a checklist of different things, right? Jesus was very much a surprise. People weren't sitting around waiting for somebody to be born in Bethlehem and to be called a Nazarene and to come out of Egypt and whatever other, and to be called Emmanuel, right? People weren't making this checklist of like, and, and then, you know, yearly or periodically evaluating people. Hmm, are you the Messiah? Where were you born? Oh, you weren't born in Bethlehem. Sorry, friend. You gotta, like, next. No, uh, there, there, there definitely are prophecies. I don't want to, um, there, there are prophecies. But even, even like this passage here isn't really a prophecy. It's just a thing that God said. And, and someone could well have come to do God's will, which which could be to proclaim his word to his people or to uh, live according to his design. It could have been understood in its original sense and was understood in its original sense. And then Jesus takes this not quite even a prophecy and fulfills it. That's what I really love 
about him. This thing that that wasn't that people weren't really waiting around. Like, oh, the Messiah is gonna uh, be a sacrifice. I don't think anyone thought that. Jesus fulfills all of God's word, even things that that aren't typically thought of as prophecies. Anyway, uh, down here in verse nine. We've got kind of the same language that we had a few times ago. Here it says, he does away with the first in order to establish the second. And and oh, I'm trying to remember. A few times ago we had something about, oh, Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant, right? I think that was last time or the time before. Jesus is, think about us. He does away with the sacrificial system because he himself is the focal point, is the ultimate, is the best, the perfect sacrifice for sins. So we, I mentioned this a few times ago, we don't bring animals up to the front of our church and slaughter them. We don't need to. Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. He's established by his own body a new sacrifice, a once for all sacrifice. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, um, the, the, the text is not necessary. The text is making this point, but, but I would say it's, um, it's like a secondary point about the, um, what, do I even, what do I even want to say? The, the, so let me, <laughs> sorry, I'm so, <laughs> I got to get my head straight. Um, the, the text is making this point, the whole sacrificial system is condensed into Jesus' sacrifice. It's um, once for all time. Now, we can also understand the once for all as, uh, now I would say the little bit of grammar, the substantive adjective all, what, what noun is it uh, begging for? Once for all time. Okay, yes, definitely. We've had up here uh, every year, um, and then daily at his sacrifice. We've got these time words going on. So Jesus sacrifices once for all time, as in you guys don't need to offer sacrifices anymore. Now, I would say that's the main freight of the passage. I would also say that we could understand this once for all as uh, like all people. Jesus' sacrifice has done it once on behalf of all people. Because we do have, uh, again, in, in verse 11 is going to kind of lead into that idea. The priest stands daily offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Now the priest would be offering those sacrifices on behalf of the people. And Jesus offers this once for all people sacrifice. So I think there's a few different ways to understand this, this once for all. And again, I would say primarily once for all time, as in you're not going to need to repeat this sacrifice. And then I would also say as kind of a secondary point, once for all people that you don't need to try to go find some other thing or person or whatever to either sacrifice or to accept your sacrifice. There we go. Uh, okay, wow. Maybe I should just read a little farther in the passage. <laughs> Offered for all time. <laughs> there we go, look at that. I, I know what I'm talking about. Isn't that always nice? Um, all right. Now I do wanna to touch a little bit on verse verses 11 and 12 are again kind of kind of what this is all about if you can condense it down into two verses the priests of the old system are there every day you can go to the priest whenever there's a bunch of different kinds of offerings there's not just the one yearly thing there's um praise offerings and free will offerings and like a whole bunch of different things so the priests are there all the time right think about it a slightly different way Drinking for dramatic effect. <clears throat> the, the sacrifices are how the priests get fed. Like, yes, 
they mediate sins before God. Yes, the aroma is pleasing to God. And yes, the priest took some of the meat that was sacrificed to be alive. So if you have a sacrifice once every year, that takes a great deal of refrigeration and freezing, which was a long ways off. Like that's to say there were sacrifices all the time for one reason among many, so that the priests could stay alive and have food to eat. So they were there every day, right? We tend to think of, um, lots of highlighting, we tend to think of the kind of once yearly thing, and that's all well and good. Jesus actually supersedes all of the various sacrifices, the thank offerings and the free will offerings and all of this good stuff. Anyway, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Okay, so there it is, for all time. And again, I think we can understand it also. This one sacrifice is powerful to cover all, peop all people who ever were, whoever are, and whoever will be. It covers all people, all people. And then he's kind of waiting, right? Jesus is... He's, he's right now, even in this period of waiting. He's ascended into heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of God. This is uh, Apostles' Creed kind of language. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. He's waiting until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy to be defeated is death, which is to say, and, and this, uh, I won't get into it. Anyway, um, Again, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That's you and me. Right? We don't have to think. Uh, I dislike when people sort of go off the rails on these things. What I mean by that is uh, we had, and, and this, is, this is kind of an aside, so I'll try to keep it uh, brief. We had a passage in one of the Bible studies I was doing. Um, what was it? It was... It was something like those who believe and are elect. And what I what I made very clear right away is those aren't two different things. There's not some people who believe, and then there's not some other people who are elect. Those are the same thing. So when you come to a passage like those who are being sanctified, that's not its own subgroup of believers. These are different ways that God's word describes you and me, believers, we are being sanctified. So just understand this as, yes, we are being sanctified, absolutely. I mean, understand what it's saying. That's that's you and me, friend. That's not like, oh, gee, I have to wonder, am I being sanctified, am I part? No, you just are. There's, there's lots of different ways that God's word refers to believers because there's a lot of different features that we have in light of Jesus' sacrifice. So there's a lot of things to think about and talk about and call us by. All right. Now, uh, I guess I'm full of asides, right? The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, now again, this may not be the primary drive of the text, but notice what it's saying about this passage from Jeremiah 31. Who, who is the author? And see, there's the nit that I needed to pick. And thank you to that viewer. Um, who is the author of this passage? Well, that would be the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit bears witness for after saying, after the Holy Spirit said, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, which as, an, as a tertiary point, the Lord declared it, but the Holy Spirit said it. So I guess the Holy Spirit is the Lord, is God, right? There's there's all of these connected points going on. I, I agree. It's a tertiary point, but still a point nonetheless. Who is the one saying these things? Well, that would be the Holy Spirit. Oh, so I guess the author of God's word is God, and there are many writers. See, there's the knit that I needed to pick with myself. The Holy Spirit bears witness. The Holy Spirit says these two things. Okay, there we go. Tertiary and secondary points, I admit, but still good points to be made. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their hearts and write them on their minds. And he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Now, this is, this is very typical of scripture, 
very typical. If you've, I, I need, which, which way? My, oh man, I can't, here we go. <laughs> Sorry guys, let's just do it like this. My, my cone analogy, where it starts very, very small, grows, and then becomes this whole huge thing. All right, oh, that, that would have been better to not have been done. Anyway, um, sorry, this passage is talking, it is given into the context of the exile in Babylon. And God is saying that after the exile is done, things are going to be a little bit different. And after the exile was done, things were a little bit different. And the people returned and gave sacrifices to God, and he forgave their sins. That's the small point. Now again, it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This, this is where this passage comes into play. We've got this whole chapter about Jesus being the fulfillment of the old covenant. And so this is the new covenant that God makes with us is in light of Jesus' sacrifice. We're starting to broaden. And this passage is also talking about the end of days where God remakes all the stuff and he dwells with us in a new and different way, like literally, physically in our presence dwells with us. So there's, there's, there's kind of three things going on. There's this, the first, the, the historical context. There's the in Jesus. And then there's the final judgment day, full and complete sense. That's, um, that, that's uh, a little bit of hand waving, typical of the Old Testament. I'll just say that. Not, not in every and all circumstances, but typical of the Old Testament. There's a way to understand it in its setting. There's a way that it speaks to Christ. And then there's a way that it also prophesies the day of the resurrection and the day of judgment and eternal life with God. There we go. And if you need, if you need a um, summary, always nice to end with a summary. Just good Good advice for your writing. I'm not critiquing God's word whatsoever. He does a great job all the time. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Oh, would you imagine? Jesus' sacrifice kind of does away with it. That's what we've been talking about. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice that you have made for us and ask that you would continue to grant us forgiveness of sins. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate you coming with me on this journey and digging into God's word. I find it to be immensely enriching, and I hope that you do too. Anyway, I will see you next time, and God's peace be with you.